Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. I don't know how the scripture gets picked for the pre-readings, but that's money, because that's exactly what I want to talk about. So this is good. But I want to start off with a story, and I've heard it, and I've kind of made up my own version, so if you recognize it, sorry, not all the details are right. But there's a, a father who had a family of five, and he always promised his family they'd go on vacation. And it just so happened for five years, they did not go on a vacation. But he was actually saving up money every single year so that his family could go on a big old vacation. And so he actually takes his family on a cruise ship. I've never been. I really want to go on one of those one day. So I wish I was in this story. But the father takes his family on the cruise ship, but he figures out, okay, I have enough for the tickets, but we have to eat like peanut butter sandwiches for every day of this trip so we can afford it. But at the end, we'll go get a big steak dinner, and then it'll be sweet. And so the family goes on this cruise trip. They have a great time, but every time it's lunch when everyone else is going to eat, they kind of silently go to their cabins, and they get the peanut butter sandwiches. And at the end, even though they had a great time, as they're leaving uh, their cruise ship, they talk to one of the crew members, and he asks, how was your stay with us? And they say, oh, it was amazing, the water slide on the boat. Who knew they put a water slide on a boat? It was fantastic. The only thing that was hard for us is we didn't get to go and eat with everybody. We had to go eat peanut butter sandwiches. And the crew member looked really confused, was like, wait, well, why would you eat peanut butter sandwiches? Don't you realize when you bought your ticket, you had steak dinner every night? It's all inclusive. Then the father goes, oh, my goodness. And the reason why I tell you that story is because I think when it comes to Jesus dying on the cross for us, a lot of us settle for just salvation. We think, okay, Jesus died on the cross for me. That whole purpose was just to get me to heaven, just to be in relationship with him. And so just like this father, not realizing the power of the ticket that he bought, we don't realize the power of what Jesus has given to us. We don't realize the authority that he's given us as believers in Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's what I want to go into today, because Jesus didn't just die so that you could have a life with him in heaven. Jesus died to make you dangerous to the enemy here on this earth. You following? He died to make you dangerous, not just save you, not just make you a nice behaving person, not just make you the employee of the month. He made you somebody to change the world. And my, my wife and I is in our, in our wedding ceremony, we actually picked a scripture that, that describes it. It was, it was Acts 17, 6, and some of the translations of that scripture, it talks about the disciples, and it says, those who have been turning the world upside down have come here now. That's the call that all of us have. It's not to be as steady as she goes. It's to be a people that bring the kingdom of God wherever they go. But to do that, we need the authority of Christ. An interesting scripture that I, that I had read in the Gospels, um, for today was in Luke 4. And I want to read just a portion of that story to you. In Luke 4, 5 through 8, it says, And he led him, he being Satan, led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this dominion and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. And then Jesus responds, Therefore, if you worship me, or, sorry, devil's still going here. Therefore, if you worship me, worship before me, it shall be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What always confused me about this story, I'm like, the devil don't own anything, man. What, how, can, how can he say that to Jesus? Say, oh yeah, the earth, all its dominion, it's been given over to me. And I've always looked at that and said, man, he can't even do that, can he? Anybody confused? Because I, I was really confused when I first read that. But when, we think, when you think about it, when the devil originally fell, he had to go somewhere. And God sent him to the earth. And when he went to the earth, he had dominion of the planet now. And that's why God actually sent Adam and Eve, the first humans ever, sent them on the earth, and he told them a very specific list of commands. He said, be fruitful and multiply. But then he says this thing of subdue the earth. Kind of a militant sounding thing, right? Subdue the earth, and then to rule and to reign in it. And I believe that had to do with something of the devil owning the earth, having dominion on it, and then God putting his authority on Adam and Eve and saying, all right, 
You got the Garden of Eden, now make the whole world the Garden of Eden. Does that make sense? And so check me on this one, please. Read the scriptures way more than I do. Like check every sermon I preach with the scriptures. That'd be awesome. But I think that when Adam and Eve did that, uh, they had the rule and the reign of the earth. And then their job was to take over, the take over the world, kick the devil's butt, all with the, the authority God put on them. But the second they listened to the serpent, that was them giving the keys of the kingdom, the keys of the authority that they had to the devil. And now the devil had been ruling and reigning of the earth. He had authority. Obviously, God is the supreme. He is sovereign. He does what he wants. He's in charge, okay? But there was an authority that the devil now had because man gave it over to him. And that's why Jesus, when he died on the cross, he says the, the famous, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Now go, therefore, and make disciples. So are you following me here? Remember the original command that God gave Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Rule and reign. Subdue the earth. I believe we're back on that track. That's what the whole thing of making disciples is. Disciples, discipling people, discipling nations. We're supposed to get back to bringing the kingdom here. And now, I don't mean to paint this picture of like crusades. I don't mean to do that. Of like, all right, so let's just shove the kingdom of God down people's throats and, and really show them, you need to serve God or else. That's, that's not my heart. That's not my intention. But I believe that we have kind of settled again for Christianity just being this nice religion amongst many. And we're not really willing to speak up when people challenge us. So with that understanding, Jesus dying on the cross didn't only save us, but it gave us the authority to get back to destroying the works of the devil. How do we use this authority? I only have two points uh, for us this morning. I always want to say tonight, because I always preach at night. So it's like, oh, this morning, this morning, this getting to afternoon. Pray with authority and speak with authority. How do we use the authority that God's given us? We need to pray with authority and we need to speak with authority. I'm going to hit that pray with authority one first in Mark 11. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. In Mark 11, I'm going to read out of 22 through 24. It says, And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. So I want to pick out some specific things. And I think whenever we see the big promises of God, we think, oh, no way. Like the, the specifics of saying, where where to go? But anyone who believes what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him if he does not doubt. We kind of look at that and say, oh, there's no way, man. There's no way that could actually happen. And we kind of settle for, again, a lesser form of what God actually wanted us to do. But when I'm talking about praying with authority, when Jesus comes to a situation, I'm, I'm going to pick on physical healing a little bit um, because I grew up thinking that was impossible. I grew up thinking, oh, okay, that was for like the Bible in those days and... That was just my way of thinking. Um, but then kind of getting, actually starting to read the Bible, it was like, oh, wow, God can kind of do whatever he likes. So who am I to say what he can and cannot do and what has passed away if Jesus Christ is really the same yesterday and forever? Um, in the scripture, or when we see a thing going on of like physical healing, often it's something where we lead, and I know it's with good intention, but we kind of lead with, oh, Lord, if it's your will, could you heal this? And we kind of ask it in question form. And at least the times I see Jesus healing throughout the gospel accounts, and I see the believers in Christ doing it from the book of Acts and on, they were commanding it. And I think they were being obedient to what the scripture says. When Jesus says, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and I'm going to call the mountain the impossible situation, whatever healing you need, he doesn't say, actually talk to me about it. Like, you've already got the authority. You're a believer. I think God trusts you. The way we've got to trust people making disciples. God trusts you to do healing. You can trust that's his will. And he says, you need to speak to that mountain and say, whatever broken bone be healed in the name of Jesus, speak to the mountain and it will be moved. And we've seen this happen in some of our small groups. One time, there was this uh, small group leader named Dylan, and he had uh, what the 
Bible calls a word of knowledge or just maybe a holy hunch or a feeling that someone needed physical healing in his small group. And so what he said, he's like, hey, I feel like God told me there's somebody in our small group with hurt knees. Is that any of you? And one of the small group members said, yeah, that's me. I've not been able to play intramural basketball because my knees have been hurting. And so they said, well, can we pray for you? He said, yes, we'll pray. And so he spoke to the need and said, knees be healed in the name of Jesus. Just a simple old prayer, not really long ones. I, I heard it once said once, you pray long, bold prayers in private so you can pray short, powerful ones in public. And that's what happened in that situation. And then the guy was playing basketball the next day, taking pictures of him dunking the ball in intramural basketball. Like, come on, that's, that's knees being healed. Oh, okay, that's not exciting, I guess. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and this is an area where, man, I, I've told you many times, it's an area I don't fully understand, and I don't pretend to. But I'd rather go out for the Lord, going after the big promises, and being someone that's red-hot, radical for Jesus, than lukewarm or cold. I, I don't want to be that kind of a person. I want to be someone that sees the big promises of God and goes after it. And if I don't understand... Not saying, well, you clearly didn't have enough faith. That's, that's not God's heart. Whenever he said someone didn't have enough faith, he usually healed them anyway. It was kind of cool. He's God. Um, but I believe he's put that authority on me and you. The next scripture I want to look at is in Luke 8, 22 through 25. We need to pray with authority because Jesus has trusted us with that authority. But in Luke 8, to make my point one more time, this is a time where Jesus, remember the story, Jesus goes in the, the stern of the boat, and he sleeps through the storm. That's where we're reading. It says, Now on those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out, but as they were sailing, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind, and the, sur and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water? And they obey him. Now in this story, disciples wake up Jesus and say, Jesus, <laughs> like, we're dying here. Could you fix this? Jesus wakes up, rebukes the wind, everything's fine. What is it when you and I pray? We, we talk to God and say, God, could you take care of this, right? So why did the disciples have lack of faith in that story? I know some say, well, it was because they were fearful in it. That's, that's, that's their lack of faith. I'd be willing to propose to you. Please check me on every scripture I preach. I'd be willing to propose to you. I think Jesus was saying, you guys had the authority to rebuke that storm. You guys could have done that yourselves. How many jobs do you think you could have where you'd say, all right, boss, you hired me to do this. Hey, boss, uh, could you fix that problem for me? I know you hired me for it, but boss, you need to take care of this. How many of you know you wouldn't have that job very long? Right? And I think that's somewhat true of our given situation with the times we live in. There's things we've not fully taken authority of that God has given us, and we've said, all right, God, you need to fix this. That's your job. I'm out. And we've not used the authority that he's asked us to do. We have the authority to do the impossible. That's where Jesus gives us, again, promises that maybe look way too big for us, where he says, oh yeah, you think I've done great things? You're supposed to go do greater. You're supposed to do the impossible. And that's where it's cool when the book of Acts happens you see now not only Jesus raising people from the dead, but you see guys like Peter and Paul doing it. It's pretty nuts. And those are only the written accounts that we have. So we need to pray with authority. We need to speak to the mountain in people's lives and say, God, take care of that. God, I'm going to speak to the mountain and say, all right, healing happened over that situation, over whatever it is. I mean, even politics. Come on. We've all been watching the news. I made us watch C-SPAN the other day because I don't get to watch it at home. It was... It was interesting. <laughs> and you just say, God, bring peace to that situation in the name of Jesus. That's praying with authority. The last thing I want to bring up is we need to speak with authority. I won't read the scripture, but it's in Matthew 7, Matthew 7, around the end of it. It just says one of the first things they noticed about Jesus 
is that he taught as somebody that had authority. They recognized it. It was like, wow, this guy's not wishy-washy. He gives the real deal. And I'm going to pick on the Midwest niceness a little bit. And when I say pick on we, I also mean me. When we tend to get into a situation where it's like about religious and spiritual beliefs, we feel like there's too much tension to speak with boldness. And I'm not telling you again to shove it down people's throat, but one of the first conversations I had on a freshman, as a freshman in college was when a small group leader from Chi Alpha sat me down, and we were just having coffee, and he starts to ask me the meaning of life, and I tell him all what I think. And at that time, I was kind of like a, well, as long as you behave and don't kill nobody, you're going to heaven. That was kind of my thinking. And the, instead of being like, oh, that's good for you, Mark. That's nice you believe that. He challenged me on my belief. I was like, the audacity. No one does this in Rozo. This is strange. Um, he goes and says, well, Mark, what do you think about Jesus when he said, I'm the only way, the only truth, the only life. I'm the only one to connect you to the Father. What do you think of that, Mark? I was like, whoa, I don't know. I just really didn't because no one ever spoke like that before. And so I, I say that story because that changed my life. So now when I'm at the dog park, when I'm at the grocery store, one of my favorite questions, because if you just go straight out and ask, hey, do you believe in Jesus? Usually people get turned off pretty quick. But if you start asking, hey, are you, like, are you a spiritual person? And I love when they don't know I'm a pastor because then they're going to go anywhere. It's fun. Um, and usually this is the response, nine times out of ten. Well, I believe in God. But I don't know if like, it's as extreme as what people say. I don't know if there's like, a really heaven or a hell. And it opens up a huge new conversation piece. Now it's like, oh, well, you believe in God. Um, well, do you believe that Jesus is real? Do you believe that he existed? Because to actually say that he didn't exist is, is very not smart. Historians all over the place, secular like, or Christian, they, they, they know Jesus really existed. So the question is, is was he the son of God or not? If you ever look at C.S. Lewis's Lunatic Liar Lord, you'll, you'll learn a lot. It's awesome. Um, but when I ask those kinds of questions, I'm no longer wishy-washy. Eventually they figure out where I stand. But that's the whole point. When we offer a testimony, our own life story of what Jesus has done in our lives, and we offer it with authority, people's lives are changed. They know that there's something on our lives, not just in us, but on us. And that's the difference. That's where, gosh... That scripture where in Numbers, it talks about where first Joshua is getting actually jealous or for Moses' sake and saying, whoa, whoa, that's not supposed to happen to the code. It was only those 70 guys. And then Moses says something I think has prophetic implication for us today where he says, I wish that the Spirit would be on all of them. That's the covenant we live in, guys. That the Spirit is on all of us if we just ask for more of Him. And then we can speak with that authority. And then in that James scripture, where it says, Elijah was just a man, and he was able to shut up the heavens for three and a half years, if I remember it right. He was just a man, but he prayed with authority. And so for you and me today, what I would like for us to take away from this, this message is to really ask the Lord and ask over your lunch conversations. I know this is, I got a friend bow hunting with me this weekend, and yeah, sorry, Dad, here's the bus, you're going under it. Um... He was amazed by, uh, he's like, you and your dad talk about the Bible and stuff a lot. I'm like, well, yeah, because it's like the whole point, right? <laughs> Don't you think? And I think sometimes we'll hear a message that maybe seemed a little bit out there and just kind of, well, that was nice. Let, let's, let's go do our normal thing. Engage in these scriptures I just shared with you today. Talk about them. Find out if I'm right <laughs> or find out if I'm wrong. I don't mind. I don't mind being rebuked and saying, Mark, you're a little off there. Find some truth. But what, again, I want you guys to do is to really ask yourself, do I pray with authority? Do I pray and do I speak with authority? Because God didn't make it, didn't die on the cross. He didn't give the best of heaven so that you could just get saved and go to heaven and be a nice person. He did all of that so you could have the authority that he's always wanted you to have, to rule and to reign in this world so that his kingdom could really come. Um, I'd like to pray for you now. And then, Pastor, and thank you so much for letting me speak here. Guys, I don't know if 
when I have a guest speaker come to my Chi Alpha, I'm as nervous as I'll get out, to be real with you. So I'm like, what's that person going to say? Oh, Lord, I hope it's not, not biblical. And so for a pastor to just trust me and just let me speak, it really speaks highly of them. And so thank you. Um, would you yeah. like me? Go ahead. I'd just like to say that we have the same spirit, that uh, you preached exactly almost what I preached last week. Ooh, and I didn't know that, for the record. <laughs> come on. We did not. Yeah. That was the scripture reading line, and it says, and they could not. not. Right. Why? He says, oh, faithless and unbelieving generation. Yep. How long should I bear with you? It was because of their unbelief. Mm. Jesus wasn't there, so they thought they couldn't do anything. So, uh, Jesus says, your prayer life is not where it needs to be. Yeah. This kind only comes out through prayer. They weren't praying with authority, so they couldn't act with authority. Amen. Al. So that's my way of saying amen with a lot of words. Cool. I, I love it. <laughs> and that's another, oh, don't let pastors talk. We get on spinoffs so good. <laughs> uh, there's so, there's my pastor two weeks ago, he just said, if you're looking for supernatural results, but you keep going to natural things to produce supernatural, you'll never get the supernatural. Amen. Kind of makes sense. Because a lot of times in our culture, well, Lord, do my healing. And I'm not saying don't go to doctors. Doctors are of God. God bless them. Um, but we often, well, gosh, I keep stumbling in sin in my life. Where when we get tired from work, we often plug into Netflix or we plug into something. In my generation, we plug into Netflix a lot. I don't, I don't know what it is for you. But it could be the same. But we often look for supernatural results out of just doing natural things. And we're not willing to invest the time into prayer and to fasting. Do we even know what that is anymore? I've had to educate a lot of students on that. It's like, it's going without food. Yep, it's biblical. Not a bad idea to go to a doctor before you do it. That's smart. It's not just for cutting weight and wrestling. Come on. Um, but yeah, I'd like to pray over you. Um, Pastor, do you still want to give the benediction? That's all up to you. Certainly. Okay, I'll just pray this idea and then come let you do whatever you like. Lord, oh, we come before you today. And I'm thinking of that uh, vision that Isaiah has is when he looks to your throne and he can just see you for all you are and the holiness that you have. It just penetrates his soul and he thinks, man, I'm so messed up. And then he looks out at the crowds and he says, oh man, that's all messed up. And then he hears your angel saying, who will go? And he says, I will go. And so Lord, I just pray that we can take this word like that, that it's like a hot coal to our hearts. If we let your authority become the authority, that we're like the prodigal son that got the signet ring put on his finger again. That he didn't have to do anything to get the authority of God. All he had to do was repent and come to you. And it wasn't like he had to live 10 years as a Christian, then he got to do the cool Christian stuff. It was an instantaneous thing. So Lord, we just accept that ring of power you want to put on us right now. We accept the authority. And I pray just a hunger in us to do the spiritual disciplines you've asked, to pray without ceasing, to be thankful in every situation, to be a people that fast and to be a people that talk about your word, to be a people that praise you no matter what we're doing. And I thank you so much for this church that believes in what we're doing. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.